Are those notes for us? Uh, these are notes for you guys. That's a lot of, no questions. He should be able to, he really prepared for this. I wanted to do enough homework here that, you know, I would be like some sort of honorary, you know, second rate goonie or something. But, you know, so. No, no, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. It's going to be great. Um, so, first question, I was wondering uh, if you guys remember where you were back in 84, 85, when you first, uh, when the script kind of first came your way and what the audition process was like. Can we remember that far back? <laughs> I can remember. I totally know. Do you know? I remember, I think, I had three, um, three auditions. And the first one was the casting director, and the second one was Steven. And then the third one was Richard Donner. All in New York. Sorry, <laughs> and um, and I remember um, in the uh, in the audition with Dick with Richard Donner. I was sitting on a couch, so I took off my shoes because the you know the character was sitting a certain way. And then when the audition when I finished reading, my shoes were gone. <laughs> Dick ate your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see like how I would. React, react or something. So I kind of had this moment, you know, where I was, you know, and at first you think, oh my God, I did something wrong. I'm never going to get this job because I lost my shoes, you know. And then I realized he stole it, whatever. He thought it was hilarious. And then oh, I that do. that playful yeah. dick. What? Weird. Oh. <laughs> He's weird. He didn't hide anything from me when I auditioned. Yeah. Actually, he helped. He, he, my, my thing was I, I kept messing up. And I kept and I kept cursing. <laughs> I did because we were cursors out there in the West Coast. But uh, uh, yeah, you guys were. We were cursors. That's always it's my, it's my mother's fault. Okay. My late mother, rest in peace. She cursed all when we were children and sets us off in a certain direction. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but Dick or Stephen walked out. Because of how many? Because well, I stopped. I said, oh, you know, whatever, I messed up, and he got up and left, and I was like, oh, well, I'll never work uh, <laughs> as a professional actor again, and then uh, Dick came around, and he got down on one knee, and he looked at me, and he was like, all right, and he really talked to me, and he talked me through it, and he said, this is what I want you to do, and I honestly don't remember anything he said, I don't think I heard a word of what he said while he was saying it to me, uh, but then I went, and I did the scene, messed up again in the same spot, cursed again in the same way, and then he said, okay, great. And uh, I, I was sure that I didn't, you know, I was like, well, it would be foolish to hire somebody who doesn't know how to do the lines. And, <laughs> uh, but I got, uh, I got the offer, so no one hid my shoes. So. <laughs> well, speaking of Richard Donner, I, one thing that I always thought was like kind of a secret ingredient or a secret sauce to the Goonies was if you ever see him in interviews, he always comes across as a really warm, like almost fatherly type of guy. And I was wondering if you guys thought that that was maybe, you know, crucial to the success of the film or dealing with such a young cast and you guys have any stories of driving him crazy as kids or... Well, he's this big barrel-chested guy. You know, he hip-hop, hip-hop, but there's like, so he's loud and scary but yeah. lovable at the same time. So I think what you intuited there is exactly, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he, th what I remember is hip-hop, hip-hop, where are the goddamn kids? That was, <laughs> that was... It was Jeff the fatherly, the grandfather. Right, yeah, and and he did. Um, he kind of engendered that chaos. Looking back now, as a kid, I don't think I understood that. I just felt like, oh, we're being bad. <laughs> but, you were so like stable. I remember you as just being calm and sensitive. Yeah, well, you guys were insane. <laughs> I, mean, like, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for it. Yeah, well, okay, let me get be? comfortable. Um, 
No, no, they, um, the kids. The kids. Yeah. Sean, Key, Corey, yeah. and Jeff were a couple years younger than Martha, Josh, and I, and they had a lot of energy. <laughs> right? Can I say that? You can be absolutely honest. This is like an intervention. No. I'm totally honest. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Which spastic. Remember when you when they let you have like sugar, sugar. Yeah, yeah, and they would time it. You'd be like, all right, give me a candy bar, and then like, oh, he's on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember they were, that. And they, they they were so little. They were so cute. Were we? Yeah. <laughs> so we're, but we but there was like you know it was and so I think I did just get very like you know like they had to like lots of times you had big wide shots or a couple people in the shot at each time and then I think a lot of times for my line or Martha's line they had to just okay we need this line so they'd have to come in on a single and get rid of everybody because it was just crazy but it was um oh I forgot what the question was we're just talking about, about Dick and his and, and his way of uh you always felt like you were in trouble but yeah. you knew he kind of liked it right yeah, that's, that's so it, it was like any family where you're, you're just trying to figure out where you're what the limits are you know I mean it was all you have to do is watch the movie we're all talking at the same time and yeah. no know. listen to the that DVD extra that yes, oh, yeah. which is yes. Funny. You, know, you mentioned the talk at the same time too um, I'm sorry but, but that was one of the things Siskel and Ebert you know they hated you know about the movie they're like oh it's a great movie but the kids talk on top of each other I completely I agree with them <laughs> no I mean there's really like talk on top of each other. they do and so I guess it works but I remember watching that we were the big premiere was in Westwood and at the man the man national theater that isn't there anymore and it's a big theater it's where they would always have these big things and we go and I remember sitting in the back and just like can't understand anything anybody's saying. <laughs> I thought maybe they would cut that part out. They make it so you know, they would isolate the dialogue. They let ev they left everything in. The whole thing is they. I think they were high the whole time they did it <laughs> because they the octopus thing is they just they leave in key talking about an octopus that isn't there because they filmed the sequence. But they had actually recorded that line before the thing, so they just left it in. And like you know, I, that's why they haven't made a sequel because I, I, they would they would cut stuff out now. You know what I mean? They wouldn't, they, would, they wouldn't know to leave the whole jambalaya thing in there. So, is anybody warming up for questions out there, guys? Uh, oh, that's right. We were here. Hi. Hey. Do you remember You look very familiar. Tell, remind me how I know you. 16 years old and she knows my movies. Oh, okay. Good. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> my press agent, everybody. <laughs> um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, my first question is, you're, you're a born-again Christian, correct? No, I wouldn't call myself a born-again Christian. What would you call yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. You're Christian? Yeah. How has your religion influenced your life and the decisions that you made for life? I don't know. Um, I think that my parents are still a certain set of values in me. I think those were kind of like the wind up to all. Um, and then faith, like my kind of faith experience is, um, it's funny because I made, I made four movies that are ostensibly Christian films. Like they're, you know, movies that were paid for by Christian audiences. I like the stories, I like the characters. And, uh, and then when being interviewed for them, we talk about being a Christian. I don't know, I'm kind of angry at my, my Christian brothers and sisters right now. I think there's a lot of cowardice in Christian right now. And uh, so I think people need, so it's hard for me to talk about my own experience without expressing my frustration. For example, with the uh, evangelical leadership in the country, I think they've totally abdicated any sense of moral authority in the last 18 months. <laughs> That's not what we're going to talk about. So, anyhow, anyhow, I'm brave. I say what I mean, and I just, I don't know. What was your second question? <laughs> Deserves is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Although I love that we're at this 
convention where the guys who put it on are really committed to screening films. Most conventions don't do that. It's like the, the amount of time, energy, and money that kind of takes away from other things. But these guys are kind of purists. So what deserves people's attention? I don't know. I try and love what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Like, I, I recently got into the show Panicula. Panicula is awesome! Yeah. <laughs> do you know what Panicula is? Do you remember that book? I thought it was a book. It is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we, don't know the show. I didn't we know turned it show. into a cartoon. I don't think we ruined it. Why does season two <laughs> coming out? We, we're just about finished doing it. Anytime. Yes! I'm so Anytime. excited. Anytime, yeah. I play Chester. Aww. Chester's the cat. Okay. All the characters, the animated characters I do, I have like one line that's the hook that reminds me of what I'm supposed to sound like. And for Chester, it's loud. It's the night of the living invasion! It's kind of loud. Have you done any animated stuff yet? It's like that, only quieter for most people. Thank you for your questions. Yes. Uh, the Color of Magic is another one that I love doing. Yes. You like that one? There you go. Okay. I have that. Terry Pratchett, the wonderful English author who passed away a couple years ago, was a friend. Love him to death. He wrote 17 books in the Disc World series. And uh, the first one is called The Color of Magic, and I played Two Flower. And Two Flower is the tourist. He's the first tourist in the disco. And he has a picture box. And if he wants to take your picture, he rotates the lever, and inside a little imp is drawing a clip. <laughs> I need more cyan! Yeah. Thank you. Questions out there? Um, I have a six and a half year old daughter who's taking piano lessons, and I literally have said the line. Uh, is it an A sharp or a B flat? If you hit the wrong note, you'll all be flat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's awesome. Um, my two two quick questions. First of all, Sean, was Carrie your first kiss? And, <laughs> and did you guys get to keep any of the really cool stuff? I thought you said, did you get to keep kissing? <laughs> Get to keep stuff? Is that what you asked? Like from the set, any of the problems. Well, so did you, did you, do I remember somebody you taking lessons or something with piano for the movie? No. Is there something, some like scene that got cut out of you playing the piano at home or something? Am I wrong on that? Oh. Is I that just in my own mind? Yeah. I could think so. <laughs> okay. Um, Was that your first kiss? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> your first on scene kiss? Well, don't tell Andrea Canetti, but sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, that you, you you ask about the audition process. So I kind of I literally I did screw up the audition. Like I was I think I was I think who I was was the character, which is obviously why they hired me. But like in terms of hitting your mark and saying your line and kind of being an on point, I wanted to be professional. I wasn't like distracted in that sense, but just was I didn't do it well. But they offered me the part, and the interesting thing was. I was being offered at the same time, this was the golden age of 80s movies, and they were offering me a test deal. You know what that means? Test deal, it's a, uh, they offer three actors, the part essentially, they make a deal, a financial deal, which is where you really start getting excited. I'm gonna be rich, you know? And, and, uh, and then they bring you all in and then choose one of you. So two people have negotiated a deal and go home, sad. So I was being offered a test deal for the explorers. Remember the explorers with River and Ethan? So, and I was like, so let me get this straight. I definitely get this job, and I definitely get to kiss the girl. I don't necessarily get that job, and there's no kissing of any girls. Yeah, like, doing Goonies was not a hard choice to make. <laughs> the funny thing was that, I want to hear your side of Stephen shepherding that scene. Does I have, do you remember it? I remember, okay, he was really little. I remember feeling very inappropriate. And I remember, um, yeah, oh, what I remember is so you put the camera like down here so the shot's up my nose. I hate that still. I, I should get over that. Should I not have said that? No. But, um, Anybody who's ever taken a selfie knows you hold it up here. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, uh, and yeah. anyway. But yeah, I remember. I, I, His thing was because of the thing that happened. Like with, he had to tell me to like, like relax <laughs> your mouth and stuff. It was very, I was all awkward. I used to be awkward. 
<laughs> so the, the story was that Steve, that in E.T., Henry Thomas apparently was like gross after he kissed the girl in that famous sequence where he stands up on the, the kid and, and they've let the frogs go and the wind is coming in and he kisses the girl. So what, it was weird because what I remember is everything was kind of shut down. You know, you, normally when you go to the set, there's all kinds of cables leading in, and there's a crew, and there's people moving, and you walk on, and things are going, and there's like a lot, a lot of activity. We walk, I walked, this was like stage 20 or something, and I walked on, and I was excited. I've been looking forward to this from the time I knew that it was going to get to happen. <laughs> I, have, I have three older brothers, so I was like, I played it chill though, right? You were so I chill. chill. I played it chill. So, <laughs> yeah. so do you know I was a nervous wreck? No. You were the girl. Why would you be nervous? <laughs> <laughs> the girls are in charge. That's what I always understood. <laughs> so, so Stephen. Because it was just Stephen. Because it was the B. It was like. It, it he wasn't, wanted to it direct his dead. own unit. Yeah. Because he wanted to control all the variables so that there wouldn't be this discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember doing like one or two takes and it being over and being so bummed <laughs> that it was moving that fast and having to act, you know, professional, like, well, good, as long as we got that, great. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, but, and then they make fun of me after I leave, that sucks. Who made fun of you? I was like standing in a ditch or something, is what he said. Carefully standing in a, Brand must have been standing in a hole. Oh, right. Because <laughs> I'm shorter. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The whole life of that. <laughs> watch that movie. <laughs> you know what? It's actually the most, according to Entertainment Weekly, the most outdoor screened movie, or at least of a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Like I'm always meeting people who, you know, we screened it on the side of a building in downtown St. Louis, or we, we, just, you know, out, whatever. So it's fun to watch it with people who are, because uh, it's like Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. People mm -hmm. know all the dialogue <laughs> and they. Sing alongside. So I don't know if we kept anything. I kept the map and then lost it. Oh my god. Oh. I, have, I have my. I have Is that my better than gave it away? <laughs> you what? I have, my, I have the sweater with the A. Oh. I think I have the skirt too. I'm not sure. I was going to say. But they didn't let us keep the jewels and everything. And when we first went on to that set, it was all our instincts were like. Hot. And they were like literally checked our pockets when we left the soundstage. <laughs> they didn't keep anything. And it, yeah, that was really, it was pretty, it was, you know. We stole tons of stuff. You guys did. I had a bucket of doubloons at my house for like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you did with more pockets. I did, I did have more pockets, yes. That's true. Still dying out on that, curiously. I think there was a question in the corner there. Yeah. Uh, were you guys aware at the time, or is there a vibe on the set, what you guys were actually on to when you were making this movie? I mean, 30 years later, it still holds up. Everybody quotes lines in this movie. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, the, I, I mean, it wasn't so beloved when it first came out. Would you agree with that? Well, not like people quoting. Not like you know, now. When you say Goonies never say die for me, or Goonies, it's our time down here, and you know, $50 bills, and like, uh, I don't think I really got the uh, the quotability of it. But like, you knew it was, it was Spielberg. Yeah. So you knew when you went onto the lot, you know, we were like, I definitely felt like a big man on campus for that three months or four months or whatever. But, but like, I went back to, five months, yeah. So I went back to school though, St. Paul, the Apostle Catholic School, and, uh, I ran for student body president, and I didn't make the runoff. <laughs> <laughs> Me, Bobby, Conker, and So like, how popular could it have been a movie if like, I couldn't even get elected to student, student body president? <laughs> well, just riffing on that, saying that it wasn't necessarily as popular when it came out, was there ever a point later on, like in the 90s or in the early 2000s, where you're like, wow, this movie's on TV a lot, right? You know, those people are still, you know, was there a point where you started to realize, like, oh, this is bigger now, maybe, than it, than it was then? Yeah. What for you? Today. <laughs> <laughs> We're starting out slow with it. This is our first, Carrie's first, I think, domestic convention. So, the fact that nobody's... I've, I've 
have been, I think it was probably around the 20th anniversary that where people were saying, oh, it's the 20th anniversary, like that was a notable thing. Uh, and then I went, I was campaigning for somebody, for a congressman who was on the education department. He was, his district was right where the Goonies house was in Astoria. So I went there with him kind of campaigning for him and it overlapped with the 20th anniversary and saw thousands of people like, jeez, it was kind of a thing. And uh, I think that's the first time that I realized that it was going, that really, I mean, right now these Goonies shirts are ubiquitous. I mean, you can go through the airport and see people wearing Goonies shirts. You know, that certainly wasn't like that for the first decade or more. I'd say it's mostly in the last like 10 years. Well, you know, it's interesting because you guys opened in the summer of 85 and you could easily make a case for that year or that summer being like the greatest summer in the history of film. Um, and your, literally your summer competition was like Rambo, Rocky, Mad Max, James Bond, Back to the Future, Weird Science, Teen Wolf, Fright Night, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. You know what I mean? and, and we're still talking about the Goonies. So, you know, that's pretty amazing to be... We can talk about those Goonies. I love those Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was curious, in, in the summer of 85, when the movie was coming out, was there any movie that summer you were like scared to compete against or you or were you just like excited to see for yourself or I don't think we thought of that. that way. Yeah. yeah. Like the box office now. It wasn't yeah as competitive back then, right? So <laughs> really, like, well, if you had a bottom well, if you were participating in the gross revenue, you know, like you know, <laughs> they, they there were still varieties that were like, you know, the horse race of who was but I wasn't I didn't know any of that really. Okay. I don't know. Did, we did you still, know what? no, we were still kids, yeah. Kids, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know when I went in to do my audition at Amblin Entertainment there in Universal, back lot of Universal Studios, there was a poster of E.T., of, of uh, R2-D2 handing a crown to E.T. It was a poster because it had over E.T. had overtaken Star Wars for a domestic box office. So I think I was aware of what, of like, that there was a competitive thing about box office and stuff, but I mean, it didn't have a bearing really. It's not like now we're da na 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 Goonies coming out again. You know, but well, now too they always find a way to like, oh, it's the number one film opening in the third week of November on a holiday <laughs> but, uh, with a major snowstorm coming. You know, they always find a way to say we're the number one this or the number one that. You know, but um, talk shows. That's how I knew that it was a big deal. Yeah. Did you do any of the talk shows around then? I remember I did one of the talk shows and I, and I was on. There was another. There's another kid. Another guy doing a movie, it had a robot. I can't remember the name of the robot, but do you remember the one? Johnny Five? No. Oh, uh, no. Like 1985, a studio movie about a kid and a robot. Not the one with Joe Baby Friend. friend the West no, Green. it was like 3,000 something, 4,000, whatever it was. We were on this talk show together. And there was something about like, which one of us was gonna talk first, connoted which movie was like. I remember that was like, so, the, somebody kind of, that's where the thought that maybe there was competition uh, in in movie space, but that really was not our uh, not our scene. We were it, we were a big like Partridge Family bus going through the movie business. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. uh, I guess questions. First, I want to say thank you. You know, I've seen the movie millions of times. I'm actually watching. My nephew's watching now, and. Um, I actually still have the program from the actual theater when it first came out. I was like six years old. I actually still have it. That's from a land where they handed out programs for movies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> My question is, um, if there is a Goonies, or if there ever is a Goonies too, where would you rather see the movie pick up from? I'm sure you have you answered this question many times? No, I mean, the, what, yeah, would you be a part of the sequel, basically? Oh, would I be yeah. part of it? Yeah, but he's saying, where would the where would pick up? If there is, where would you like to see pick up from? Well, I think like, the only way we could be in it, it would be if we were the next generation Goonies parents. I think so. Which would be cute. But I thought for the longest time. I think I actually think we should do it now, like as old people, <laughs> <laughs> put the sweater back on and stuff. We just have to stop and take Advil once in a while. <laughs> Well, Corey and I, we, and people have been asking this question of me forever, and I 
actually, Steven Spielberg sent me a poster a couple years after the movie. One of the, 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 the one where the map is cut out, and it's the silhouette of the Goonies on the side of the hill. And he had written big across the whole poster, Sean, I'm still a Goonie, how about you, Steven? So the first time I ever, you know, conceived of the thought of a, of a sequel is, you know, every movie you ever do, there's always like, oh, it should be a sequel. Um, you know, it's a Titanic, you can't just, it's like, it's like, it goes down, it's not coming back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but was, was through Steven, so, and when I talked to him on the phone, like, sometime that year, so I had to have been in 87, he said, well, he was going to wait till Henry Thomas was in his 70s to do a sequel to E.T. And then he said, but no, with Goonies, you can go do younger. We can go, we don't have to be 70s for Goonies. It's not quite as, yeah, it's just different vibes. So, so he clearly wanted to do it. They have made, um, they've spent millions and millions of dollars having screenplays written that never got made. They just, Stephen just hasn't pulled the trigger on it because he's used the word secret sauce. I think they really don't know what the, that, they're not, they're afraid that if it's not magical like it was back then, then it's, you know, people will be disappointed. You don't want to do something people are going to be disappointed in. But Corey Feldman and I wrote a whole sequel outline. Was, yeah, it was good. It was fun. You were in it. You were in it. <laughs> you were in it. Your character, I wrote for your character that you were, well, you have to deal with you and Brand. And like you and Brand, we, oh, I, I think we're like separated. I think we had to be separate. There has to be drama. Yeah. <laughs> But you had just been at the uh, at Buckingham Palace, <laughs> and uh, one of and, and which one's the younger one of the of the Henry? Is he, which one's the prince? The younger prince, Prince oh. William and Prince Harry. 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 Harry knew that we were opening a museum in Astoria, and so he loaned you this really cool artifact from the time period, and uh, for you to bring back. So when you came to the opening of the museum, you were like, oh, and it ended up being a really useful artifact that nobody could have known. But anyhow, it goes on. It goes on. <laughs> Stan, so, Dan, so we go to Dick Donner to pitch this idea. And we, we, it's really involved, and he's listening to it, and he's listening to it. He has all these development executives around or whatever, kids, whatever, I don't know. And, and he, Corey and I are going back and forth and back and forth, and, and you know, telling the story, and Dick is just, eyes are closed. He's, <laughs> he's listening. He really looks like he's listening to jazz music. <laughs> he's just listening, and, and afterwards he goes, wow. He goes, you guys spent a lot of time on that. We go, yeah. He goes, yeah, we're, we're not doing that. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know where to pick it up from, but her idea was, your idea was good. I'll tell, I'll tell. The artifact that, she, that whatever the prince was, no, listen, you're like, so we're opening the museum, and the museum is where the old cave room, where the... Where the pirate ship was. It's empty now, right? So there's a little lookout desk. And we realize, and I real Mikey realizes that this gift that he's giving you is actually the key to a puzzle. So we go back into the cave room at the bottom of where the thing is. Like you walk, the, 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 the water slide is like this, and you kind of walk down through the water slide with the, with the, you know, and there's little descriptions about things. And we take this thing and we put it in, and when you turn the lights out, it creates, you see the stars all in the cave room, and we put the little jewel in that you brought from the thing, it shows a map on the ceiling to... This is so good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's yeah, good. it's really That's good. That's more than I've ever told, but it's only because Carrie's here and I... It's fun. So, yeah. When are you guys making that movie? Look <laughs> <laughs> at that. I don't know. You know what I'm You see where I'm <laughs> you mentioned the ship, and I actually wanted to talk about that too. Um, from you know, from what I've heard, rumors, um, you guys were part supposed to be isolated. They made this giant ship, and you guys want they wanted you guys to be shocked before you guys see it. However, I also went to a panel with Corey, and he said that he snuck in one night and saw it beforehand, so he already knew what it looked like. Did any of you guys see it beforehand? How did he get in before? <laughs> Corey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a vampire in. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Corey, did you? Had you seen it? No. You hadn't seen it? No. Did you follow the rules? I was. I did. You're a rule follower. 
So were you, um, I mean, go ahead. I, I, I can't well, believe Well, what, what I remember, actually, I didn't remember this. My mother remembered this. Tell me if you remember this. That they brought us all in. None of us, I guess, except Corey had seen it before. <laughs> and they, like, kind of, did you? Had you seen it? I didn't see it. I, well, you did. You sure <laughs> I did not. However, who else saw it snuck in? Everyone but me? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I don't know about everybody else. I know that uh, I didn't sneak in. I walked by when the door was open. I kind of like wandering around the lot. And I walked by when it was open, but it wasn't that close to being finished. So I did, it didn't look, the finished version didn't okay. look anything like what I had seen. But you know, this whole concept of we're going to get the kids genuine reactions because they can't act well enough to look surprised to see the, the ship. But like we, and they had, you know, it wasn't like digital age where you could have 15 cameras all over the place. Every camera had like three people that operated it and, the, and you know, if one of the mags jammed, that was a thing. And so they had these like pontoon things or whatever, these like, these scaffolds in the middle of the water where we did it. But go ahead, so what, what did your mom do? What she said was, so they brought us in, like kind of, were we blindfolded? I don't know. Yeah, back, they backed they us in. They backed us in, and they wanted us to get under the water, like, okay, well, whatever. They gave us like a certain cat, go under the water, and after a count to three or something like that, and then come up and see it for the first time. So we did that. But you know how earlier you were talking about all the cursing and stuff? Yeah. Everyone was like, and all their expression, everything they said was unusable in the film because of the language. And so then we had to do it again. So what you saw was acting as opposed to a real thing. That's what, That's what I, does that right? I, I, the cursing thing, I think, is just a steady state for me. But like we actually, there's <laughs> cursing that's left in the there's movie. There's a lot of improv, which ends up being a lot of yeah. curse words. Which is unnecessary. Like, if I would go back, I would not curse as well. There's a couple of things where I curse, and you're like, that kid's cursing because a grown-up let him, and it's on, I don't know, I don't like it. But um, <laughs> it just seems fake. But the, which is weird, because the reason they left but it in is because. why it's still a big hit. <laughs> I think it's true. Um, not just, yeah, the dynamic about, yeah. No, but we, I, you know, I, to me it was like, okay, we're going to have our reaction for the first time. I, it seemed stupid and insulting to me. But you're not going to say anything because you're happy to be at the party. And we, we, they, <laughs> they backed us in to this thing. And I remember, uh, we, it was a long time. We were standing there. I remember it seemed to me like a long time. It was. It seemed like 10, 15 minutes when you know there's a pirate ship behind you that you're not allowed to see. Every second feels like a month, you know. Yeah. And I, so, uh, and I don't know that the ship ever looked as good as it did on that with that moment because they had it all lit with the different water things. And sometimes if you're not going to see the back, you don't have to do water over there. But they had it all kind of going at the same time. And I just felt like a kid who had already seen the Christmas present who had to act surprised so the parents felt good about the Christmas present. You know, like, oh, that's really, yeah. Well, it makes you self-conscious about your original response. So, like, you're under the water and kind of saying, okay, I've got to look really, like, how, how do I actually look, I don't, you, you, it was a weird combination of being authentic and acting and self-conscious and, yeah. like, you were sure. hoping to give them what they wanted and does this look good enough? But it means know. it means something that they that they had an idea. Like it's one thing to like you know you build a set and you go in and you're doing dialogue and so the whole concept of a film is happening. But the idea that we're going to capture reactions from performers in this unique way, like you wouldn't do it. Like would you shoot a horror movie like that? We're gonna you know the, the corpse is actually kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Careful, these people are nerd of horror. Know your audience? Maybe you do. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I thought that was a strange thing that they that they tried to do, but it's made for a story for all these years. Yeah. 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 That's. I, we, you need to get um, Martha. She'll be the. Oh yeah. She'll she be the deciding vote on what. Yeah, and she would have like if she would have seen it and thought they were full of it. I, I, I believe it if she said it. Um, yeah. It was a special set. People came from all over the known filmmaking world to take in that set. 
Um, I think the set that had been on it right before him was a Ghostbusters set. Speaking of great, that's the, the Zool, you know. The Another movie you competed against that was re-released in the summer of '85. You're talking competing. Well, so, I mean, you know, I'm just saying, you know, when you go up against movies like that, and 30 years later, you still talk about up like your movie. Oh, you know? crap! <laughs> Are you a journalist? <laughs> Are you? I'm working some negative angle. In no, no, no. <laughs> it's you're just this. You're off this moment in time where everything's about competing. Sometimes the thing itself is what's cool. And they, I, they, the Goonies is a time capsule. Yes. It's a time capsule movie, and then like the whole concept of the, the map and the everything. It's 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 uh, time capsule. Movie. It's beyond your your Hollywood competition rates. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Uh, we had a question in the back. Well, I actually have a piggyback question. What you guys just talked about with the uh, keeping some cuss words in, some not. Um, I showed my friend Goonies at. He's like 18 years old, because we've ever seen it. Um, I showed it, and uh, he's American. He is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The hardest <laughs> he laughed was when uh, Jeff is watching the car chase. He's got the milkshake and he goes up against the wall and squirts on him. He didn't laugh at that. He laughed at him going, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> and I just wondered, you guys know that that was one of those that was ad lib. I mean, he was every like, single laugh. curse was ad lib. There was not a curse in the script. <laughs> I think that's right. I think Dick Donner would have luxuriated in the oh shit <laughs> pizza ice cream thing, whatever that was. Yogurt. Seriously, it was on the ground. Yeah. Like dying. Yeah. Just because of him saying it the way he did. Well, I think they were better, like better kids than I was a kid. Some of those, they were some of the like catchphrase lines that people have remembered for all these years are lines that I didn't like when it was time to do it because they didn't feel like they were real. Yeah. They felt hokey, and like hokey scores, hokey lasts. And I've had to tell me that myself that over the years. Like you know what? Sometimes it's okay to be, I don't know, presentational or something. You're like you know a little bit self-conscious. I don't know. Um, besides James Bond, what character would you want Data to be a fan? Of? Besides James Bond? Yeah. So you're a Bond fan. Well, I mean, like, because he already is a uh, Bond fan in the movie. Oh, are you asking about data? Is that what you said? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even hear it clearly. What? Um, oh, interesting. Because I talked to him, and he said he would want to be uh, Indiana Jones. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Because he was <laughs> short around. Yeah. I thought he would have said, like, Jackie Chan or something. <laughs> He's, uh, he, he is, do you have, have you seen him lately? He's, like, I love this man so much. I literally, like, I've been married for 26 years. If I wasn't, though, I'd try and, like, jump into their family. <laughs> he is, they're just so, they're such good, he and his wife are such good people and decent people. We we joke around all the time. So, uh, so uh, yeah, let it feed back through fandom that, uh, to Key that I thought Data was a Jackie Chan fan. <laughs> <laughs> Did he? Yeah. 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 Me too. I was always curious if you guys had uh, any like fun moments when you remade uh, doing Encino Man with Key. He, I think it was John then. He was he changed his name to or he I don't know what to say changed it. I don't know if Jonathan Kwan was on his Jonathan Kwan was his legal name for a long period of time, and I think lately he's gone and and retaken Key or. Or sort of use that publicly now. So I don't know, he's, he's got to answer that, but but that's when you said that, I'm like, oh, John, I remember hating that movie so much I couldn't even see straight. I was like, I wanted to be a serious actor. I just played this like homeless person and lost all this weight, and I was like, I took myself way too seriously. Like, if one of my life regrets, if I could go back and redo Encino Man, where I actually relax and enjoy Polly Shore being silly, and, and I mean, my, the, the best memory that I have of that was of, uh, Brendan Fraser and me playing video games in the dressing room. <laughs> I mean, I've got some fun kind of like injury memories on that one, but um, but he, I we, I didn't. It was like I was looking through the back end of a of a, a telescope at him, like, oh my God, there's my friend, and he was like so far away, and we didn't really we didn't really do anything. I wish I could redo that time. Take that back. Take that time back. Give that, that one back. Time you read that. Yeah. Uh, I got two questions. Um, Carrie, how was it working with old Corys? Oh, well, they weren't the Corys when I worked with them. Um, um, so, so in on the 
the Goonies, the boys were kind of like a big whole group, I would say. And with, with on Lucas, Corey and I worked a lot, just the two of us. So I really felt very um, close with Corey. Hanging with Corey Feldman, that was like a big group, big family kind of. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so they're just, to me, the sweetest boys. And I know, like, they're, you know, crazy for a man. And they're sort of. Has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he came down to the photo op, he and Corey and I are, are uh, and Corey's got uh, one of the uh, costumes from his, his show. His, his, he's a, from his, his concert. And it's all, it's, he's lit up. <laughs> it wasn't just sequence, he was lights. It was all lights everywhere. Lights. Oh. Yeah, and he was like, Corey, what are you doing? And then we took the picture, they look kind of good. But, yeah. But go on, I'm sorry. I don't yeah, so I mean, they're, they were, um, when, when I was in college, once in a while, I'd get a call from both of them, you know, but it was. Um, <coughs> when they were becoming the Corys. When they were becoming. Like the height of Corey Mania. Yeah, uh, I had kind of tucked myself away out of the. <laughs> out of that world for a while, but, um, you know, I never worked with them to, together. So to me, they're just two very separate people and very, um, you know, just both, both incredibly dear people. The other question was, uh, do you have any funny moments or stories about that you remember, the moments that stand out the most, thinking back any time somebody says to me? There's so many. <laughs> what? Well, I mean, there's just like, I mean, so much of it was just like, Michael Jackson came to the set, or we were <laughs> at Dodger Stadium, or they flew us to Hawaii to play a joke on Dick Donner. Like, there's just so much. It was, it was like you said, like a, a high. It was a heightened period. For heightened sure. period yeah. when there was there was m uh, money for jokes, or you know, nice. like, right? Yes. Like, like, money after for after jokes. the eighties, that didn't happen, but they flew us to Hawaii to play a joke on Dick Donner because he was sick of us and he was going to Hawaii. And we were there waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> like, just for a joke. <laughs> they do not do that stuff anymore, but yeah. yeah. Flint Hawaii is not <laughs> So, like, that kind of, like, there is just a lot. That story was the first time we'd heard uh, the Cindy Lauper song was there, right? Yeah. Didn't they oh, yeah. was there? And, like, um, uh, Ann Ramsey was Ann, Ann Ramsey was there, right? And all and and the Fratellis, and and, and they, they were they delayed their kind of entrance to the party till after Dick had calmed down from seeing us like take over the we like took over the house we turned everything over and we were, and uh, and then all of a sudden he looks it's in Maui at his beach house and he looks out towards the beach and just like in the Goonies up come the Fratellis from the thing I thought Dick was gonna have his head was gonna explode you know he, all he could say through the whole show was I can't wait to get away from you brat kids and get to Maui you know. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, some, some people send gift baskets, I guess, but like, Stephen sent the whole, all the goodies. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think of, I think of Sloth. To me, the, the Goonies go from being a group of kids to being something bigger than that when the, you bring the, the, that character into it. And John Matusak, the late great John Matusak, was, um, you know, a killer with a heart of gold. And, uh, you know, watching him suffer through that makeup, like I don't even, I don't even know how he did that makeup. It was ridiculous. But with, with his sound, hey, you got like that kind of thing, makes all of a sudden, I don't know, just everything sets up. Everything kind of becomes something more than the sum of its parts when, when he gets into it. So when you say Goonies to me, you kind of think of him. Yeah. Yeah. We had a question for uh, Sean. Um, I'm like a big fan of uh, war films. What was it like making uh, Memphis Bell? Memphis Bell was incredible. You know Memphis Bell, the World War II movie, uh, air movie, the 17 bomber? Um, I hate to break, well, I don't hate to, but you can't help but think about it today with what's going on in, uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula. And, uh, Amer you know, our country has this fascinating history with air supremacy in, in, uh, in wars for the last, you know, since airplanes started, you know, since the biplane era. Um, it's amazing that there's a whole world
that lives at 20,000 feet. You know, you can, I don't know how to capture this, but it, we would fly in formation, we'd actually go up in these B-17 bombers and you would see Eric Stoltz and Matthew Medine and D.B. Sweeney and Harry Carter Jr. and all those guys, like in the plane right next to you. Like right, like as far as we are. You're like, hey, good to see you, right? And then we kind of, we, the, the planes would turn like that and firing those 50 caliber machine guns and doing the research for the, the character. They sent us all this information about the Second World War and it was a pretty great, it was David Putnam. David Putnam was the, uh, who, who produced uh, The Killing Fields and Chariots of Fire and um, uh, what's the one about with Robert De Niro? Um, anyhow, no. it felt like being a part of something important and shooting at Pinewood Studios, which is talking about James Bond. Uh, they filmed there, so we were like on the Bond sets and stuff, and that was all pretty, pretty was that, special. Like, real loud and everything going around. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, the ball turret, you know the ball turret is. It's a little thing underneath the B-17 bomber that is. It's like a, it's a rotating ball. Yeah, well, you have two fifty caliber machine guns, and it's to guard the bottom, the underside of the plane. And uh, those guns are massive guns, and there's two of them, and you're kind of like in this cradle position, and they're going off right next to you. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, actually, because a second ago you mentioned the Cindy Lauper video. Um, I think I always wanted to ask Carrie is that of all the main cast members, you're the only one that's not in the music video. Yeah. Were you like already working on Lucas? I was or? doing summer rental. Oh, you're doing summer rental. Oh, okay. another great summer. You yeah. Yeah. Well, we competed against him. <laughs> <laughs> outside of the editing room so the actors wouldn't see it because if the actor sees it they'll change their performance somehow and which again is insulting but um, but Dick Dick's feeling was you know it makes them better you know that if an actor sees something they want to do something a little different so I think it actually it's a little it's a compliment on a couple levels it, it, it's it's it shows that he has confidence in, in who he's hired or whatever but so I remember this one time it was, it was not too far from the commissary where lunch was, and it was one of the days that my mom came. I, I had a guardian who took me to work every day, because my parents had a life, and they were like, they can't do that every day. Um, and I remember there was a scene that, there was a shot that Dick added in the, in the, um, in the basement before we go down in the fireplace. And, and this, this, it's so kind of self-conscious, but he, it's a shot where, like, it's the Robert Redford shot. Like, he looked, and the camera's just like this, and there's a shaft of light. 
all starts here. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, and I remember, I remember him wanting to shoot it, and, and like, you just kind of like rise to the moment, like, okay, I am, of course, I, I'm, I'm a matinee idol. Why wouldn't I be on this shot right now? And uh, but my mom came and saw it, and she stood in the back of the theater, and I remember looking at that shot, that kind of like hero, gauzy, like golden shot or whatever, and looking at her, and she was standing there with eyes like this, and tears were coming down her face, and I was like, Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, funny. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time, guys, so let's give them a round of applause.